I think we should probably just go ahead and get started. If I may introduce Dr. Harry Selker, Chair of the Clinical Research Forum, who will uh, get us going this morning. Please go ahead, Dr. Selker. Oh, it's just great to see you all here. Hello, everybody, and, and welcome to the Clinical Research Forum Top 10 Clinical Achievement, Clinical Research Achievement Awards. I'm excited and honored to be able to open the celebration of these um, outstanding research examples across the entire span of clinical and translational research. Mm -hmm. I'm, of course, as some already noticed, I'm in my home office today, and like many uh, across the country, Clinical Research Forum uh, had to change its plans for its meeting this year. This is not a dinner meeting, in case you were wondering what, when the appetizer was coming. We've had to make adjustments due to the coronavirus pandemic for our, our health and safety. And so thank you for carving out time uh, on a day like this at your home, which is so busy now uh, for this, com for this uh, celebration. Um, you know, as clinical research and participants in the clinical research enterprise, we have shared the world's transfiction with this coronavirus uh, pandemic. We're completely okay. focused on what we have to do to stop it. Never has there been such an overwhelming worldwide example of what clinical research is for and that it is really our only hope. And this is what we are trained for. This is what our enterprise is, is set up for. This is what we do. In, in the middle, therefore, of this biggest clinical research challenge of our lifetime, it is important to celebrate the exemplars of clinical research, the kind of work that folks are offering to this world, which is in so much in need of stopping uh, disease, disability, and, and, and poor health. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's just a great moment to do this, and I also think it, you know, our offering to the world in, for suffering is exemplified by the, uh, the studies you'll see in just a moment. We hope that this helps remind the public of the importance of clinical research. Uh, we do, we very much advocate for that at Clinical Research Forum, and we hope that this helps people realize that this is really, every day that they see this going on, how important this work is, not just right now, but also as it has been in the past and as it will be for future health challenges. So there's just not a better moment for this, so thank you for joining us. Um, before we get started, though, with the awards, I want to introduce the man who came up with the idea of the top 10 awards and remains its inspiration. Dr. Herb Partis, a vice chair of Clinical Research Forum and also a longtime national leader in, in, in clinical research, healthcare delivery, and as leader of Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons and New York Presbyterian Hospital, and a mentor to many of us and a dear friend. Herb? Well, thank you very much, Harry. I can tell the entire audience here, that there's a very fine group of people who constitute the Clinical Research Forum, and Harry leads it beautifully, and you're going to hear from others as well. I'm delighted to be here with all of you. We really, uh, over a period of time, felt we wanted to give clinical research greater recognition because it deserves it. Clinical research, as Harry beautifully stated a moment ago, is very important. Uh, it's important because science is advancing our clinical trials. Science and our data is why we are able to make a difference in people's lives. And in this terrible era right now, it is particularly uh, critical. Uh, it's a time when we as a community are completing our best work. Clinical research needs more attention, needs recognition, and also needs support. Uh, it has solicited the best in clinical research We've had some wonderful recipients of awards here by virtue of the nature of their work across multiple institutions. Just examples from today, Northwestern, Stanford, Tufts, uh, Penn, Ohio State, Wake Forest, it goes on. The, most of the largest academic centers are part of the Clinical Research Forum. So the top 10 awards are designed to honor great work uh, and uh, call greater attention to the clinical researchers, and we hope their academic centers also recognize how important they are. So thank you all for being here. Congratulations. Uh, we're now going to have a short video that I hope you enjoy, and we'll go from there. Nice to talk to all of you. Thank you, Herb. My study is a phase three trial that was designed to determine whether targeted therapy is superior to chemotherapy in older patients with previously untreated chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. 
Prior to this study, most patients who were over the age of 65 were initially treated for CLL with a combination of bendamustine plus rituximab, which is a chemotherapy regimen that's very effective, but also does have significant side effects for many patients. We sought to determine whether a targeted therapy called ibrutinib, which is an inhibitor of Bruton's tyrosine kinase, or BTK, was superior to bendamustine plus rituximab when it was given either alone or in combination with rituximab. After our study was completed, we did find indeed that targeted therapy either alone or with rituximab was superior to bendamustine plus rituximab. At two years of follow-up, 74% of patients treated with chemotherapy were progression-free, while 87 and 88% of patients treated with targeted therapy were progression-free. This study therefore changed the standard of care for patients with untreated chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The project that I'm going to tell you about involves a breakthrough, life-saving discovery and development of an innovative precision-based therapy in a 12-year-old child with a complex lymphatic disorder. The project began by our discovery of a new mutation in a gene which is called ARAV or RAV kinase, and this opened up a completely novel pathway for this complex, life-threatening lymphatic uh, disorder. The mutation was a gain-of-function mutation, so the pathway was on all the time, and this drove a proliferation of cells that resulted in fluid leakage into the heart, lungs, belly, and extremities. We subsequently took the mutation and we put it into a zebrafish, and the fish developed a lymphatic phenotype that we saw that we could rescue by giving an inhibitor drug, which was an adult cancer drug only approved for melanoma cancer. We subsequently took that same medicine and we treated cells from the patients and we saw that we could contain the hyperproliferation or the overreactive state of the cell growth uh, in the patient cells. We then went and asked for compassionate use single uh, IND approval from the FDA and the IRB, and it was granted, and we started treating the patient with an inhibitor against uh, uh, this particular uh, overreactive pathway, which is called the ERK signaling pathway, with a medicine called a MEK inhibitor, and uh, the patient responded very rapidly, and in a few months resolved more or less all of his symptoms. Lung function went back to normal, and he is currently involved in daily activities without hardly any compromise at all, including running track. He couldn't stand up from a chair because he was a swollen before. We've since treated seven patients, who all of whom have mutations in different genes in this pathway, and they have all responded in a very comparable, uh, magnificent way. The Credence trial was a trial that was designed to study canicaflozin, which is a drug that people with diabetes take to lower the blood sugar. And we wanted to evaluate if canicaflozin improved kidney function in people who have type 2 diabetes and have kidney disease with it. Credence showed that canicaflozin reduced the progression to kidney failure by 30% compared to placebo. Importantly, it also reduced cardiac death and hospitalizations for heart failure by 31%. This finding is really, really important because it is the first drug in 20 years that shows that you can improve kidney outcomes and the progression to renal failure or kidney failure and hemodialysis in people with type 2 diabetes. Multiple myeloma is basically um, very resistant to most therapies, although we have treatments now that can keep patients alive for up to five or six years, eventually the multiple myeloma becomes resistant to therapy and the patients almost all die of multiple myeloma. We decided to treat the multiple myeloma with a T-cell therapy. We remove the patient's own T-cells from their body, genetically engineer those T-cells to express a receptor that gives the patient's own T-cells the ability to recognize and kill the multiple myeloma. This treatment, invented first at the NIH in my lab and then went on to test first clinically here at the NIH. Our first results were quite um, promising. We saw an incredible decrease in multiple myeloma in many patients. This led to 
a multi-center trial in collaboration with industry partners as well as other um, extramural um, collaborators in many universities across the country where we tested this in advanced multiple myeloma patients with very few other treatment options. We had um, an 85% response rate and an 11.8 month progression free survival rate. Phase three trials are actually very far advanced at this point. Um, many patients have been treated on the phase three trials. Um, results have continued to come in that are promising and this treatment is hopefully progressing to a commercially available product so it can be used to help more patients in the future. Multiple sclerosis affects people in the height of their life or careers and destroys their mind and ability to do things. Traditionally there's no cure and you're looking at only trying to slow the rate of progression of the disease, the rate of damage to the central nervous system. What this research has done is shown in a randomized trial, it not only slowed progression but it actually improved neurologic disability and patients, the vast majority, went into very long-term remission without new evidence of disease activity for over five years. It's taken a chronic disease and with a one-time treatment turned it into an acute illness that you can recover from. The most rewarding thing is to see them come back and that they're better because when you're healthy you take it all for granted. The patients are so grateful and so happy, just glad to have and to appreciate what you had and lost and thought it would never come back. The main question we were trying to answer is whether or not smartwatch technology can be used to identify atrial fibrillation. We enrolled over 419,000 people in the course of eight months. So one of the largest uh, cardiovascular studies ever done. The smartwatch was able to monitor for an irregular pulse, and if they qualified, they were mailed a patch monitor that they were able to apply on themselves. After a seven-day period of wearing this patch monitor, they simply had to mail it back. We were very excited to see that only a very small number of these participants had an irregular pulse notification. And as we later saw, many of them were having atrial fibrillation when they had that irregular pulse. This study is important because it really serves as a model for future studies that would like to perform clinical trials in a completely virtual manner. From the very beginning to the completion of the study, it can be done without participants having to physically go to a hospital or a clinic. Over the 60-year period uh, that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been a clinical disease, uh, sudden cardiac death has been perhaps the most uh, visible and certainly devastating uh, complication of the disease. And we live, of course, now in an era where uh, contemporary medical therapy, in, the, in, the, in this regard, the implantable cardio defibrillator, or ICD, um, is uh, available um, to treat life-threatening monomorphic VT tachyarrhythmias and to prevent sudden death. And this has put uh, an enormous emphasis, therefore, on identifying reliably those patients that are most at risk for sudden death events who would be the best candidates uh, for primary prevention ICD therapy. Our study evaluated uh, the efficacy, really, of a risk factor algorithm that we have applied uh, which was based on uh, a number of individual major risk markers that have been previously established um, and are part of ACCHA guidelines in 2011, as well as a number of new, novel, high-risk markers as well that have emerged over the last decade. For patients that had one or more of these major individual risk markers, uh, we considered them to be at a risk for sudden death that was increased enough uh, that it was reasonable that they pursue primary prevention sudden death therapy in the form of the ICD. And what we found over our, our, our follow-up period uh, was that there were 82 patients who received an appropriate shock for life, potentially life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias that were implanted because they had one or more of those major ACCHA risk factors. For parents who've had a premature baby, all vital signs of that baby need to be monitored. And the way that happens currently is with a rat's nest collection of wires and adhesive tapes that bond sensors to the surface of the skin. 
our goal was to reproduce all of the kind of functionality that's currently provided with these wired-based sensors with these wireless battery-free skin-like devices. Implementing the antenna systems and the data recording hardware that go along with these devices and deploy them in a real operating NICU. It softly interfaces with the skin and allows us to measure electrical activity associated with beating of the heart so we can capture EKG waveforms. What we're able to do now is correlate changes in heart rate, changes in temperature, changes in blood oxygenation that occur as a consequence of the mother holding the baby. And so our goal here is to make the wires go away and enable the parents to interact more naturally, more frequently. Peanut allergy is a very common reason for life-threatening allergic reactions that land people in the emergency room. And peanut oral immunotherapy is an approach that's been studied to treat peanut allergy. The POISE study looked at 120 peanut allergic children and adults and randomized them to receive peanut oral immunotherapy or placebo over the course of three years. 85% of those who received peanut oral immunotherapy were able to tolerate 16 peanuts without an allergic reaction by the end of two years, compared to 4% in the placebo arm. Safety measures continued to improve the longer you were on peanut oral immunotherapy, and reactions to accidental ingestions from peanut decreased the longer you were on peanut oral immunotherapy. And what was really exciting is for the first time we saw that blood tests done before patients started therapy were able to predict successful outcomes at the end of therapy. For many years, our nation has invested a large amount of money in uh, trying to discover ways to prevent and treat uh, dementia. And so this study, Sprint Mind, provided the first evidence in history that we can actually do something in the physician's office to reduce a person's risk for developing dementia in the latter years of their life. Five years ago, we already established that a blood pressure goal of less than 120 millimeters of mercury, systolic blood pressure, actually reduced heart disease, heart failure, stroke, and heart death by 30 to 40 percent. Now we've shown that you can reduce memory loss, early dementia, by 15 to 20 percent doing the same thing. More than 80% of people over the age of 85 and more than 50% of people over the age of 50 have elevated blood pressure. And so Sprint Mind showed a clear relationship between blood pressure control and reducing the risk for dementia, which is a major public health goal for the United States. For years we've been saying, do what's good for your heart. Now we can say that what's good for your heart in terms of lowering blood pressure is also good for your brain. And that was not known until this year when the study was published. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying congratulating all our top 10 awardees and also thanking all our guests for being here. Uh, it is my pleasure. I'm, I'm Albert Reese uh, and I'm the executive vice president at the University of Maryland and Dean of the Medical School. But it's my pleasure to work with uh, terrific colleagues like Dr. Selker and Dr. Uh, Pardes. As you, as you heard momentarily, uh, uh, Dr. Pardes is, uh, is a hero of mine, so uh, it's just a pleasure to work with him. And to really be a part of this top 10 uh, research awards. And I wanted to say ahead of time that this is one of my most enjoyable events each year, to read exhaustively your applications, your abstracts, and to spend an enormous amount of time trying to find the very best among the best. It's, it's, a, it's not an easy task, but one that I enjoy. So let me tell you how we're gonna begin. You've had a, an opportunity to see this uh, wonderful video of each of the awardees making their various presentations. Uh, we're gonna proceed just by giving by my, my commenting very briefly, if you will, a little vignette of the science and the significance, because we're interested not only in the top 10 uh, science, but also the impact top 10 science either is having or, or likely to have on clinical care. So let me start with our first top 10 recipient. 
Our first top 10 recipient is nominated by The Ohio State University. And this is the work of Dr. Jennifer Woyak. She did a randomized phase three study of two chemotherapeutic treatment options for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This is a phase three study. It's one of the first trials to target this older population. It compares standard chemotherapy with ibut ibutinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, for the initial treatment of patients age 65 or older. In this specific clinical trial, the two-year progression-free survival with ibrutinib was 87% compared with 74% with chemotherapy, chemoimmune therapy. Because of this study, ibrutinib is now a standard of care for the initial treatment of older patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This entirely changes the paradigm of initial treatment away from general chemotherapy toward targeted therapy. Congratulations to Dr. Wojak. Well, thank you very much. I just would like to thank the Clinical Research Forum for um, choosing to recognize this study. Um, and thank you for your tireless support of clinical research. Our next top 10 recipient was nominated by the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And this is the work of Dr. Haken Arson, who, whose study is an innovative therapy for complex lymphatic anomalies. Complex lymphatic anomalies are chronically debilitating and often cause life-threatening rare diseases that disrupt the circulation of lymphatic fluid that result in swelling of multiple organs. Unfortunately for most patients, physicians can offer only palliative care that does not correct the underlying cause. In this particular study, the team performed whole exome sequencing on the DNA of a 12-year-old boy. The DNA sequencing revealed an undiscovered mutation in the ARAF gene. Based on this information, the team devised a targeted treatment plan that included a MEK inhibitor known to act on biological pathways affected by ARAF. The patient has shown significant improvement on this therapy. Now, it's the knowledge of this genetic mutation that's important. It allows us to devise therapy, and which in this case was life preserving. We want to congratulate Dr. Egan Arson for his important work. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a great honor to be uh, among these uh, 10 uh, uh, recipients uh, of the, the uh, Clinical Research Forum uh, uh, Awards. I mean, this is a uh, tremendous, tremendous honor. I just wanted to add that uh, I've never seen this before, but the lymphatic system in this patient completely remodeled to a normal lymphatic system uh, after therapy of approximately nine months. Uh, so it's just incredible. And we've seen that now in, in the other patients that we have treated. But thanks, thanks, thanks again to all of them. Thank you, and congratulations. This is absolutely terrific. It's, it's so nice to, in my own lifetime to see us using uh, uh, understanding gene sequencing to direct therapy as a consequence change outcomes. So that's so very, very impactful, important and impactful. I always will leave a, uh, a minute or two to hear if my colleagues want to comment. So I will pause here for a moment. Okay. Our next top 10 recipient nominated by Stanford University is the work of Dr. Kenneth Mahaffey. Dr. Mahaffey and his team participated in a landmark clinical trial to identify a new treatment plan for kidney protection in patients with type 2 diabetes. This clinical trial involved over 4,000 participants in 34 countries and showed that the approved drug, canagliflozin, lowered the risk of kidney failure by 30% in people with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease. Based on these findings, the FDA has updated the canagliflozin label to include kidney failure as well. Congratulations to Dr. Mahaffey for his, and his team for this very important work. Thank you so much for this incredible reward, and I'm honored to accept it on behalf of all my co-investigators. And thanks for the incredible work that the Clinical Research Forum does 
for promoting clinical research in the US and around the world. Dr. Mahavi, congratulations and thank you very much. This is an incredibly important area, uh, particularly patients who suffer from chronic disease. So we're delighted that your work is targeting a, a population of patients who so badly need this type of intervention. Thank you. The next is the next award. The NCI uh, nominated uh, Dr. James Kokendefer for his study on CAR T cell therapy for myeloma. This study was led, led to the development of a novel chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy for the treatment of relapse, relapse myeloma. The approach used the body's own immune system to treat cancer. The study observed complete responses in patients who receive larger number of CAR T cells. In fact, 40% of the patients were free of progression one year after treatment. This novel therapy is showing great promise with patients having relapsing multiple myeloma. So this is, again, another extraordinarily important topic and subject for patients not only who have multiple myeloma, but those who have recurrent or relapsing myeloma now have a tremendous therapeutic intervention. So congratulations to Dr. Kovinderfer and your team for this wonderful work. But thank you very much to the Clinical Research Forum for this um, award. I greatly appreciate it. Obviously, my research was a, a huge team effort. Many, many people were involved in this aside from me. So I extend my thanks from all of my coworkers, and we greatly appreciate the recognition for this um, wonderful award. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's good, good to hear your voice, even though we keep, couldn't see your face, but uh, uh, your work uh, speaks for itself. So thanks, thanks greatly. Our next award uh, awardee is Dr. Richard Burt. He was nominated by Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine for his study also on relapsing multiple sclerosis. Dr. Burt pioneered hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for multiple sclerosis. He became the first person to use HSCRT, I'm sorry, HSCT in preclinical models and the first in the United States to treat MS patients in this manner. Dr. Burt's randomized hematopoietic stem cell trial demonstrated that the disease can be reversed. More than five years after stem cell therapy, most patients show no evidence of new disease at a relatively low cost compared to the current MS drug treatment. So once again, the excitement of having not only intervention, but almost, but remission and virtual cure. So let me extend on behalf of the research forum, congratulations to Dr. Burt and his team for another tremendous breakthrough. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Reese. And I wanna thank the uh, uh, Clinical Research Forum for all their hard work and efforts, and especially setting up a meeting that then they had to suddenly change to this Zoom format. But I, I wanted you to know we did prepare our poster. You can see it behind my desk here for your meeting. Uh, um, and it's just a pleasure to see that this is presented. I, I want to thank you so much for giving importance to clinical research and also congratulate the other top 10 awardees that you've recognized, as well as the many excellent clinical papers out there that didn't make it to the top 10, but I'm sure were very difficult for you to make that decision for. Later today, uh, I will be giving a 15-minute talk, and that will focus on the broader implication for society of this study, which I hope everyone will be able to watch. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Dr. Bird, thank you very much, and con congratulations on your, on your continuing effort in this area. Our next awardee was nominated by Stanford University School of Medicine, Dr. Marco Perez, for his large-scale uh, digital study. And you saw uh, earlier work that was presented. Dr. Perez and his team use a technology such as a smart watch and a mobile app to identify heart rate irregularities that subsequent testing confirmed to be atrial fibrillation. As a first clinical study on this scale, they studied over 400,000 participants via a mobile app across 50 states, 
researchers found that 0.5% of participants receive irregular pulse notification, and one third of this group were later found to have atrial fibrillation. The study researchers learned a from the study they learned a tremendous amount about engagement, participation rates, interaction with the healthcare system, and follow-up actions. This study serves as a foundation on which future digital health studies can be designed and also have tremendous impact on patients' health and well-being. On behalf of Research Forum, we extend congratulations to Dr. Perez and his team for the important and impactful work in digital health. Dr. Perez. Thank you so much. Yes, no, this was, a, this was really an amazing team effort. I mean, this is a this is something that required just a large number of people from uh, multiple different um, uh, uh, resources, and and uh, you know, I, you know, one of the things I really like to do is just thank a lot of my colleagues, uh, my my co-PI Mitu Tarakia, uh, our our study chair uh, Dr. Ken Haffey, and really the Stanford Center for Clinical Research. Um, you know, we we had you know, involvement from you know, multiple statisticians, uh, information technology. This really required uh, an effort that, uh, that a really comprehensive effort from multiple, um, uh, multiple people. And so I, you know, I think you know, we're, we're really excited about the, the idea of, of uh, digital technology being something that, um, that can really bring, um, bring a new type of clinical research. Uh, and and you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about is the, the, the idea that, uh, that uh, this this digital technology can can really democratize clinical research in many ways and and bring uh, bring clinical trials to to uh, populations that normally might not not might not be included. So uh, again, yeah, I think uh, one of the other things I'd like to do is just thank the sponsor because it was really a collaboration and, and really with the reach that they had, you know, we were able to to do this this type of study. So we're really really excited about this this. Uh, some of the some of the ideas that we were able to bring to this clinical trial that we hope will carry forward to future digital digital studies. Well, thank you, Dr. Perez. We very much appreciate the effort, the leadership, and most importantly, the success the successes that you've had thus far. Thanks Thanks. Again. Thank you so much. The next uh, awardee was nominated by Tufts Medical Center, Dr. Martin M Maron for the study on the prevention of sudden cardiac death. Hypercardic trophy, uh, hypercardia, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common cause of sudden death in young people. And as you heard uh, earlier, implantable cardioverter defibrillators or ICD are life-saving devices that can respond to dangerous arrhythmias by jolting the heart back into normal rhythm. This group, researchers uh, have followed more than 2,000 cardiomyopathy patients over a 17-year period to test the risk assessment strategy. The results show that strategy is highly effective for predicting which individuals are at risk of sudden death in their work. The team created a risk assessment strategy which clear, with clear definitions and criteria that includes new cardiac risk markers. This work was extraordinarily important. It will allow doctors henceforth to identify high-risk patients who are the most deserving of implantable defibrillators. This has been, until this study, a difficult decision to determine who are at the highest risk or at greatest risk and are most deserving. This study, in fact, will create an algorithm that will help doctors determine when and whom to receive these. So. On behalf of the Research Forum, we want to extend congratulations to Dr. Maron for his, and his team for this wonderful work. Dr. Maron. Yeah, well, th well thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that, uh, those, those kind words very much. I want to thank the Clinical Research Forum first for the recognition of this type of clinical research and also their tireless efforts to promote uh, clinical research initiatives uh, across science. And uh, I also want to take the opportunity to really thank uh, my colleagues uh, at, who are part of the Tufts HCM Institute, uh, who without their efforts and work and focus and dedication uh, to this disease and to, the, <clears throat> and to these patients uh, would never have allowed 
this type of what I'll call in the trenches clinical research to ever come to fruition. Um, so it was certainly clearly a team effort and I uh, really appreciate uh, everything that, that they did uh, to enable this type of work uh, to actually happen. Uh, thank you very much again for the recognition and it's also an honor uh, to be recognized with uh, the other um, investigators whose work is incredibly impressive. impressive. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moran. Thanks for your work. Our next uh, top 10 recipient was nominated by Northwestern University, and that is Dr. John Rogers. His studies on wireless monitoring, particularly in the NICU. As you've seen uh, in, his, uh, in the film, existing NICU monitoring systems require multiple electrodes censoring systems uh, throughout. The associated web of wires complicates even the most basic bedside tasks and impedes skin-to-skin -skin contact. Dr. Rogers and his team developed new NICU wireless monitoring technology to replace traditional wire-based systems, allowing parents to cuddle their babies, giving healthcare personnel improved access to the infant. A single skin-like sensor placed on a, the infant's chest and his foot has dramatically improved medical outcomes for the most fragile patients. These devices have the potential of not only being used in developed country, but most importantly, under, uh, can be used in underserved populations worldwide. So again, the impact of this work expands in a tremendous way. We wanna thank Dr. Rogers and his team for their, for their impressive work. Congratulations to you, Dr. Rogers. Uh, thank you. I, I have the uh, honor to, to accept this recognition um, uh, as uh, one of the team representatives. Our work really espouses um, the very best of team science at Northwestern and Lurie Children's Hospital. Engineers from nearly every area of technical study working with doctors and nurses from neonatology, autonomic medicine, pediatrics, and dermatology, uh, working together to improve the critical first weeks of life for our most vulnerable patients, premature neonates. And we set out with an audacious goal. How do we cut the cords of monitoring systems that cause skin injury, complicate nursing care, and prevent therapeutic skin-to-skin -skin contact between mother and baby? This award is both a powerful recognition and a catalyst for our continued efforts to improve neonatal world care worldwide. Thank you on behalf of our whole team. Wonderful. Thanks very much, and congratulations. Our next awardee is, uh, was nominated by uh, Stanford University. It's the work of Dr. Rebecca Sharon Chintraja. Her study was a randomized study of immunotherapy for peanut allergy. You saw that on the film. This clinical trial evaluated the sustained effects of peanut allergy in oral immunotherapy in a randomized long-term study. You know the goal. The goal of the study was to dampen the immune system or, and, and, and the immune response so it would no longer be life-threatening. The study which was conducted a randomized clinical trial showed that peanut oral immunotherapy can in fact desensitize most individuals with peanut allergy using 400 milligrams of peanut protein. But discontinuation or even a, a reduction to 300 milligrams daily increased the likelihood of rega regaining clinical reactivity to peanut. These findings suggest that patients might have continued might have the the <clears throat> might have to continue oral immunotherapy indefinitely in order to maintain the, the desensitizations. The findings may result in the first FDA-approved treatment for peanut allergy. This would pave the way for more food allergy treatment options and greater access. We want to thank Dr. Chintradeja and her team for this important work in using immune-based peanut allergy. Dr. Chandra. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Andrew. Just happy to be here accepting on behalf of the team. Uh, we just wanted to say it's a great honor to receive the award uh, on our entire team, uh, as well as the participants and their families uh, who stuck by for you know, years to complete the study. Uh, it takes a village to care for those impacted by food allergies, and this study uh, led to meaningful findings in the treatment, moving one step closer to bringing uh, that effective and lasting therapy to the millions of peanut allergic patients in our country 
uh, as well as others. So we just want to say uh, thank you again to everybody involved. <clears throat> Thank you and congratulations. A very important topic, and and I'm very happy that you uh, you delved into it. It may uh, uh, lead to long term impact. Our final top ten recipient was nominated by Wake Forest School of Medicine, and that is the work of Dr. Jeffrey Williamson for studying dementia in the Sprint trial. Fifty million persons suffer from dementia worldwide but there's currently no proven interventions to prevent dementia or mild cognitive impairment. Hypertension is a strong risk factor for dementia and is one of the most common illnesses with prevalence increasing with age and affecting 75% of persons older than 65. This study was specifically designed to see if patients who were more intensely treated for high blood pressure with a goal of achieving a systolic blood pressure of 120 or lower would actually lower the risk of developing dementia or mild cognitive impairment. The study actually found more intensely treated patients had a 19% lower risk of suffering mild cognitive impairment and a 15% lower risk of suffering either mild cognitive impairment or dementia. The results of this study have demonstrated for the first time a treatment strategy for preventing or delaying cognitive decline. Please help me in congratulating Dr. Williamson and his team. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Reese. But uh, I really do want to thank the Clinical Research Forum. Uh, it, it's just a great honor uh, to be uh, numbered among these 10. My wife and I were just saying that if we could have a, a one hour replacement of most cable news shows with this kind of uh, <laughs> programming that we're seeing today, we, our, our nation would be so much better off for it. Um, but I really am accepting on behalf of many, many investigators. A lot of the universities represented on this call, in fact, were part of Sprint and Sprint Mind. And so I'm just grateful uh, for the friendship and collegiality we've had there. Uh, also for the 10,000 people who volunteered, uh, our, our citizens really still volunteer to help us uh, discover very important things like uh, the ability to reduce dementia even in older people. And then finally, I really want to thank the NIH institutes for collaborating, the uh, NHLBI, NIA, NINDS, um, and NIDDK all came together to help fund this trial. And it showed at a national level the, the kind of collaboration that clinical research really uh, takes. So thank you. Uh, thank you for those kind comments, Dr. Reese. And uh, thanks to all my colleagues and congratulations to them on this uh, call. And thank you, Dr. Williamson. This you are indeed correct. This has been a been a extraordinarily uh, broad, deep, and uh, extensive study with a lot of uh, important findings. So I'm very appreciative of the work and efforts that you've put into this. Congratulations again to all our winners. We will now move to recognizing the top three prize winners. Distinguished Clinical Research Achievement Awards are presented to the top two studies that show creativity, innovation, or a novel approach that demonstrates an immediate impact on the health and well-being of patients. Each award comes with a cash prize of $5,000. Today's recipients join an elite company of past winners. Their studies have made significant impact on patient care, and their work is admired by the scientific and healthcare community. Our first Distinguished Clinical Research Award goes to Dr. Kenneth Mahaffey for the study, Can Glyphlazin and Renal Outcomes in Type 2 Diabetes and Nephropathy. Dr. Mahaffey's research represent the first study in 20 years to identify a therapy to reduce renal complications from type 2 diabetes. His findings have the potential to fundamentally change the care and the outcomes of tens of thousands of patients worldwide who suffer from this disease. Congratulations, Dr. Mahaffey, and your team for an outstanding work. Well, Dr. Reese, thank you so much for uh, this incredible award among a great group of investigators in the top 10. And thanks again to the Clinical Research Forum for sponsoring this program. As I said before, I'm honored to accept this on behalf of all my co-investigators, including Dr. Perkovic, who is the study co-chair. Thanks to Janssen for supporting the trial, and more importantly, for the partnership 
that was a successful academic industry collaboration to conduct this study. We always need to recognize the site investigators for their tireless work. And of course, all of the participants who were both volunteers and partners in this study. As you've said, we hope these results will help clinicians improve the outcomes of our patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Thanks again to the Clinical Research Forum for recognizing this work and its promotion of clinical research and mentorship. Thanks again. Dr. Uh, thank you. You have uh, you certainly have made a tremendous contribution to, to which we are most grateful. I want to congratulate you and your team. Our second Distinguish Award recipient is Dr. Richard Burt. For his study, hematolo uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for frequently relapsing multiple sclerosis. Through this study, Dr. Burt has already improved the lives of patients who are suffering from MS. His findings will help researchers further understand MS and other autoimmune diseases. It will also aid in the development uh, <coughs> and, and refine targeted treatments. We're delighted that Dr. Burt's work continues to really uh, clear a path for the role and the effectiveness of targeted treatment. So for this, for this accomplishment, we will extend our congratulations to Dr. Burt for in this occasion. So con Dr. Burt, congratulations very much. Again, thank you very much. Uh, um, it's uh, to me very rewarding that it is recognized by uh, distinguished uh, uh, people such as yourself in the Clinical Research Forum. This began actually over 30 years ago when I was a fellow at uh, Johns Hopkins and at the National Institutes of Health as a simple concept or an idea that we first started in animal models, worked for 10 years, then phase one, phase two, and finally the randomized trial. And in that randomized trial, I want to give thanks to my colleagues who helped run it with me besides uh, those here at Northwestern University. Uh, colleagues at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom, the University of Uppsala outside of Stockholm, Sweden, and the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, all of whom contributed uh, patience and efforts uh, to uh, complete this uh, randomized study. Uh, the most important part of what this has shown is that we can take a chronic disease and convert it into an acute reversible illness with a one-time treatment, which we'll discuss more, to, more later this afternoon in the 15-minute presentation. So again, thank you so much. Dr. Bert, thank you. Well, I think what, what you've seen here is the fact that many of our clinical research, or probably most of clinical research, is really a team sport. And uh, each of the investigators have made it very clear how important their, col their collaborators have been to the success of their study. So. I'm going to be transitioning to my colleague, uh, Dr. Herb Pardis, but let me just say before he, he speaks, one, my sincere congratulations for the depth and the breadth of the work that you have done. It's been extraordinary. But, and most importantly, though, for the impact that your work is having or will have on patients to come. That's why it's so important that we support clinical and translation research, not just for the excitement that we gain in doing research, but also for, for the impact. I'll be transitioning now to Dr. Herpardis, the uh, or colleague and, and mentor and friend, who really was the brains behind this top 10 award. So with that, Dr. Herpardis. Thank you. First of all, I'm, I'm pleased I'm to collaborate with Dr. Reese, who's one of the outstanding deans of medical schools anywhere in the world. Uh, and to say that it's a delight to present this Clinical Excellence Award given to the study, which received the greatest recommendations from the review committees. Uh, this particular study stood out because it shows how clinical engineering and science can come together to improve the lives of families. Doctors Rogers and Dr. Zhu from Northwestern used innovative, non-invasive technology to gather vital information for neonatal clinicians. The study and results are remarkable because they support the development and continued care of our most vulnerable patients, young children. So congratulations to Dr. Roger. Congratulations to Dr. Chu on your accomplishment. And I believe we're going to ask Dr. Chu to make some comments now. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Pardis. I mean, this is such very special additional recognition amongst 
uh, a really distinguished group, and we're we're so honored uh, for those kind words and and the Partis uh, Award. Uh, we'd like to thank the Clinical Research Forum for for recognizing us and giving us an opportunity to to uh, be recognized for this work. Uh, we knew from the the very start that our secret weapon, uh, babies, uh, would give us a, an advantage in this context, and. Um, it really took an amazingly uh, dedicated team from engineering to clinical medicine and nursing to make this all possible. Um, this was a major undertaking. We're very proud of this, but we, we want to say that uh, we're working now to accelerate and continue our development of this technology to make it available to every premature neonate worldwide. And thank you again, Dr. Pardis. Thank you to the Clinical Research Forum. Well, Dr. Shu, thank you. Uh, let me or just raise a question with you, if you could tell us a little bit more. Could you say a little more about the kinds of benefits that this will mean for both patients and, and doctors? Yeah, absolutely. So I think if you think about monitoring systems, there are a lot of physicians on the line. Um, it really hasn't changed much in the last 60 years, right? There's still large boxes connected to wires and electrodes uh, on patients. And I think this makes it very challenging in the context of premature neonates where the thing that parents that want to do is hold their babies, right? And the single biggest barrier to that is the monitoring equipment that also is keeping them alive. So by working at the very forefront of engineering and clinical science, providing soft skin-like devices that recapitulate core vital signs that are being collected in the NICU, but then also add additional parameters of high value like continuous, non-invasive, cuffless blood pressure, there solves a lot of problems and issues that the NICUs faces. For instance, we can make it easier for nurses. Sometimes it takes an hour just to turn a baby. Um, we can sort of solve that problem. These sensors are skin-like, so when you remove them, they don't cause uh, injuries that are very, very common with existing wired systems that require strong adhesives tethered to large boxes. But I think most importantly and most poignantly, it allows mothers to hold babies uh, much more closely to their chest, to their body, without having to uh, navigate the wires and, and trip alarms. And I think that will sort of offer great benefits to children if you think about the power of skin-to-skin -skin contact, from normalizing heart rate, improving feeding, reducing mortality, decreasing length of stay. So these monitoring systems, they provide life-saving information, but they also better enable life-saving therapy, which is a mother's touch. Dr. Hsu, that's just marvelous. I think we were going to open it up and see if anybody else wanted to raise any questions. Dr. Reese, I don't know if you or, or others would like to uh, ask any questions of Dr. Zhu. Hi, Dr. Pardis. It's Andrea and Dr. Reese and Dr. Shu. Thank you so much. We actually have to wrap it up because uh, translational science is starting right now. Um, so I'd like to turn it over. Uh, Dr. Harry Stelker had to leave to head over to uh, click on his other link. Uh, to start translational science. So he apologizes for having to do that. And he asked me to uh, turn it over to Dr. Reese to say goodbye. And hopefully all of you will join us in just a minute at translational science. Dr. Reese. Thank you, Andrea. So once again, uh, let me say to everyone, first of all, uh, it's even though we would have loved to have been at the, uh, the, uh, been to together physically, uh, it is, this has been a very reasonable substitute that we can at least hear each other and see some faces, but most importantly, it's the work that you've done. Uh, we're really excited about uh, seeing the extraordinary clinical and translation work that you've done. Uh, you've given us a tough job to make the, the, the decisions, but that's great because we get a chance to read all your work. And we're just very excited. So once again, please extend our, our sincere congratulations to your entire team, your, your, each of you in your various teams, so that they can understand and appreciate the fact that it, it's so meaningful to us. And even though we do this, uh, uh, it's a labor of love, and we want to keep con uh, encourage you to keep working on these areas so you can continue to make impact on patients' health. So once again, with that, I think this concludes the top 10 Research Achievement Awards for 2020. We look forward to seeing you in the remainder of the sessions as well as next year. Thank you.